Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the last Art Salon panel for today. Um, my name is Philip Tenari, the director of the Olin Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing, and I'm very pleased to be here today with three distinguished panelists, uh, Christopher Moore, uh, writer and publisher and co-founder of Rondian Online, Daniel Ho in the middle, also of Rondian, a critic and a very well-known um, art commentator in China, and Li Zhenhua, one of the uh, foundational presences in the Chinese art scene over these last many, many years, and most recently, actually, also the curator of the art film section at Art Basel Hong Kong, uh, relevant for these purposes. We're here today to talk about uh, an artist by the name of Xu Zhen, uh, or actually uh, Xu Zhen produced by Maiden Company, or actually Maiden Company. Uh, and these terms are somehow and somewhat interchangeable, which is one of the topics we'll cover later. Uh, it's of particular relevance because there are actually two uh, very important pieces of his on view here uh, in Hall 2, uh, I'm sorry, in Hall 1, and uh, again in Hall 3. Um, here you may have seen uh, his piece, Eternity, uh, which restages the Elgin marbles, but juxtaposed with, uh, of course, um, unlikely uh, Chinese sculptures, and that uh, was actually produced here in Switzerland and uh, has become a little bit of a logo for uh, this whole conversation uh, that's been very present during this edition of the fair about uh, what it means that we're actually now with particularly Art Basel having expanded into Hong Kong, seeing an enhanced convergence between um, Eastern and Western trends and tastes. Uh, the other piece of his, uh, which is called In Just the Blink of an Eye, is one of the 14 rooms, which is uh, a part of the eponymous exhibition uh, in Hall 3, uh, co-presented by Art Basel, Theater Basel, and uh, Byler, of course, um, and uh, and there you'd see if you were to go uh, a, a a human figure suspended as if falling, uh, with a, a kind of um, an armature beneath them that you can't see, but in this kind of uh, extremely precarious and yet also quite comfortable uh, position, um, which maybe says something about the situation from which the work comes. Uh, but particularly relevant today is this publication. Do you want to hold it up? Uh, which has just been published by. Uh, Distanz, uh, of course, the esteemed Berlin publisher, uh, and which is edited by Chris, and which has contributions from uh, those with whom I sit. And, uh, and it's actually the first uh, serious monograph on Xu Zhen and his practice. So uh, it's an apt moment to convene a, a kind of discussion about that. And I think we should begin not at the beginning, but at actually the present and this book. And uh, I would love to hear first from Chris just kind of about the structure, the thinking, uh, and the idea behind uh, behind this publication, which is just called Xu Zhen. Uh, thank you, Phil. This book came out of a series of discussions with Xu Zhen and also with Lawrence Helbling of uh, Shangart about three years ago. And eventually, uh, between three of us, we sort of decided a book had to be made uh, because there was, at the time, no monograph on Xu Zhen. And probably one of the reasons for that is that when you look at Xu Zhen's work, particularly his early work, it's always so different. It's very, very hard to say visually what is the oeuvre of this artist because every single time he did something totally different. And there was um, Rainbow, a video of, of uh, a man's back uh, being slapped, uh, slowly turning red, and you hear the slaps, but you don't see the hands slapping the back. Um, there is it. Uh, Arguably the world's smallest artwork, it's a grain of sand on which when you peer through a microscope you can see uh, the footprint of Neil Armstrong on the moon. Um, and then there's other things like his, um, you know, in the blink of an eye which is on display uh, in its present incarnation in 14 rooms where a person appears to be suspended midair. And you know, how, what links all of these different things? I mean, apart from the fact that in, at the beginning there was certainly a very strong influence um, uh, from people like Bruce Nauman and uh, with very uh, physical performative art. Um, but the question was how to provide some sort of uh, context for approaching his work. Because in the basis is that he examines the media in all its horrific connotations, all its possibilities, its brilliance, and then sees what, how that could be twisted up, churned out, and then represented again as something new and concrete that undercuts all 
of its con uh, uh, um, contingent parts. And this is what makes it so difficult to talk about him. So we had to start off, how do we, how do we put this in some sort of context? And so um, when I was writing about it in the book, I was trying to give some sort of a background to um, the generation of each stage of his, his work up until he became made in. And then uh, David Elliott, uh, who can't be with us today because he's busy opening his um, uh, Moscow Biennale, and he was putting it, looked at Shugen in the history of the world history of, of conceptual art. And then Philippe Perrot, who unfortunately also cannot be with us, who was uh, recently appointed uh, director of uh, the Städelschule and uh, Porticus. Um, he looked at how Shugen uh, approaches the, his involvement with the art scene as a curator, because Shugen is much more than just an artist in China. He uh, founded uh, art Baba, uh, an online forum that is completely chaotic f for discussion about art. Uh, he also uh, helped found, uh, found um, uh, Biz Art, uh, which was really the first Kunsthalle in China. Uh, he also founded a, a somewhat subversive small gallery uh, called uh, Shopping Gallery, playing on um, the name of Deng Xiaoping, um, and many, many other things besides. And to really get a grip on where that all comes from, you know, all these, these many different aspects of, of his life, uh, his, early, his early stages as an artist, the best person to talk about that is somebody who knew him right at the beginning, which is Li Jianghua. So perhaps at this point, we should probably hand over to you to discuss about those in the early days, that's, that stage in Beijing. Um, yeah. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think this is, might be rare to to share with you um, about early time in Beijing, because I, I think uh, nowadays people understand about Chinese art with a certain certain uh, notion of the market, and also with a certain notion of that Chinese art is always making uh, massive works. But when I meet with Xu Zhen in 1996, we are like two kind of lonely soul and then encountered in the Sunli Tun area, and he was riding on uh, this kind of female kind of bike, the big bike, and, and try to looking for some um, chances to meet with some people. And I was like running a little kind of gallery cafe, which is like making art shows, but mainly about selling the cafe to people because nobody really interested by any art. And then we were like trying to talk about, you know, maybe we do a show together. And he next day he brought me some kind of uh, a handmade uh, kind of a collage of little kind of objects and put it in there. And I think this is a very beginning moment of how we understand each other, that we do have a, a, a passion about um, to do something, but I really don't know at that time whether it, this is, can be so important uh, today. I mean, or Xu Zheng can be so important today as one of the major uh, leading artist uh, from Shanghai. And also one thing I think I have to really mention that um, in the late 90s, we were working with many uh, artists like Chiu Zhijie, Yang Fudong, uh, and uh, uh, many more from Beijing with so-called the post sense sensibility um, groups. And that time Chiu Zhijie said, Xu Zheng is the only one who's supposed to be inside the post sense and sensibility group, but he never stepped in. But then as I was doing this archive of this uh, post and -sens sensibility kind of movement, I treat Xu Zhen's show, like one of the show in the supermarket is as part of the post and -sens sensibility, and also as well as uh, other people like uh, uh, Gu Zhenqing's projects, you know, people dealing with the, the, the meat and, and animal stuff, and uh, Li Xianting's show with this uh, uh, to Shanghai, the million. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of these things that we have to, I mean, go through uh, since the 1996 until, until now, because I think this is a very long period to know a friend and to know an uh, artist really developed through the whole kind of process of actually knowing nothing but just, you know, being there and doing something. 
and you know he was in Beijing. He don't know. Um, I, he told me he doesn't know really. You know what the next day would would happen to him. And he was visiting all these kind of so-called artists living the old summer palace uh, village uh, or in, in the east village because there's still a lot of artists. I mean, living in a, a very extreme condition, uh, which is like um, one on one hand they're doing art, but in uh, still in a very much the stress of the society and the government still kind of chasing them down and and there's no market there's no people kind of helping and that time i think you know we're kind of go through a moments of um really um a hopeless i would say a hopeless moment but also try to find uh, you know tr or try to define um, ourselves to to be uh, continuously working in the scene and to I would say, you know, the market came um, after uh, 2005. And of course, during that 10 years, a, a lot of things had happened in China. And I do think it's very interesting that um, David Elliott put Xu Zhen into this uh, conceptual art uh, cate category or area, because I think uh, Xu Zhen is a very, very important uh, Around the 20, uh, 2000, around 2000, because he was doing these uh, uh, shows with Yang Fudong and Yang Zhenzhong, and that was a, a, a leading group in Shanghai. And that's also, I, I do think, that was the, the moment Xu Jin set up his uh, um, wide range of possibilities of organizing exhibitions, running space, and uh, working with other artists, and also. Uh, as Chris, uh, Chris mentioned about the, the bizarre art situation, they were helping with a lot of young artists from Hangzhou and Shanghai and from Beijing. So I do think, yeah, that's, that's, that's makes Xu Zhen important. It's not only because he's highly important in the market, it's really about what he does in the last 15 years um, for Shanghai and also for many, many artists. And also I think for the market, because he's the one who turned himself into this so-called uh, made-in company. But at the moment, he's also turning back. Uh, so made-in company and Xu Zhen is called is existing at the moment. So I, th I find that very interesting, very tricky, very interesting, because he's always doing that in a way to try to find a possibility also from you know, creating the market. It's not only eating or beating by the market, it's about creating the market. And recently, his restaurant also launched with a collector of, <laughs> of Chao Zhibing. I think that's, that's wonderful, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of themes you brought up um, that kind of point two ways in which he's been uh, unique and, and key presence in these last uh, two decades, really. Um, I mean, just to draw out a few more of them, I mean, one, one interesting thing is, of course, that he, unlike so many of the very well-known artists in China, didn't attend one of the elite art academies. He didn't come from Kafa or from the China Academy. He came from a kind of technical art school in Shanghai, which we're not even sure if he really ever graduated, but we don't really care. Um, uh, and I mean, he, he has also been someone empowering and pushing the system uh, for, forward to develop with very, uh, very kind of consistent and, and important series of interventions at different points uh, organizationally. Um, it's, um, I, I mean, we just organized a retrospective of his at UCCA earlier this year. And we, we divided the work, I mean, not the exhibition, because the exhibition was kind of total uh, visual chaos. But uh, in terms of our thinking about the work, you know, into a couple of distinct periods, one was the kind of early works that begin in the 90s and run through about 2004. Uh, from about the middle of the decade, as the market picks up, you do have a kind of increasingly ambitious series of installations. And this is when you get projects like um, a giant dinosaur, uh, split into kind of in weird homage to uh, Damien Hirst, or uh, something like The Starving of Sudan, where he completely recreated a, a very famous news photograph uh, by Kevin Carter, which Alfredo Jar is actually also engaged with, and invited people to kind of come into this scenario and be part of this kind of awful spectacle of watching a, a kid uh, next to, in this case, a robotic vulture, but a, a real kid. Um, and, then, and then a very important thing happens in 2009, which is when he decides to uh, kind of regroup and rebrand and relaunch under this new moniker, which I think Daniel will talk about in a second. But uh, I think it's also important before we go there to talk about a really key problematic, which is sort of his relationship all, all through all of this with the notion of being a Chinese contemporary artist as opposed to just uh, an artist. Um, it's something that's most kind of accurately reflected in 
uh, his response to a questionnaire, which actually the collector Uli Sig uh, circulated in the catalog for Mahjong, which was, of course, his collection show that was at the Kunstmuseum Bern in 2005, uh, where at the beginning of the catalog, he kind of asked all of the artists to reply to a slate of questions that were kind of all uh, to the effect of, you know, how does being Chinese affect the way that you make art? Uh, what recognizably Chinese elements are there in your output, and so on and so on. And he actually just turned the questionnaire around and replaced the word Swiss for Chinese and the word collector for artist uh, and sent the questionnaire back. Um, but I, I think that was, in a way, uh, the precursor to uh, the founding of Maiden Company. And that might be a great place to ask Daniel to kind of step into the conversation and talk about that. Well, Hello, hello. Yeah. So, I mean, um, in, in 2009, I mean, he sort of all of a sudden say that he's going to, you know, end his work and then subsume everything to Made In. And, uh, and in a way, like he over the last uh, three years until very recently, he's been producing work collect, well, supposedly collectively under this corporate moniker um, Made In Company. Uh, only very, re just to say that only very recently, uh, he's doing something where he's saying that uh, this is going to be, he's the, the company is reproducing himself as a brand. I mean, I think uh, the, I think what's interesting is like you know instead of going down a route that you know a, a much larger scale of production that some artists in China have done or elsewhere have done, you know, a much larger sort of workshop with a lot of assistants. He's all he's also like decided to give a lot more uh, more of an equal emphasis, even though inside, I mean, he's still a very creative director. You know, but there's a lot of stuff that um, he, he, he sort of wanted it to become a little bit uh, more collective. However, it's still not like a, I mean, I think what's important to emphasize is that he, he's, he has all these plans to play with it. I mean, actually he has all these plans to play with uh, the idea of even collecting, actually. He's mentioned this in several interviews where he wanted to even, you know, sort of play with certain roles of the art ecology of the art world. But I mean, these are plans that he's still uh, going ahead with. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just feel like uh, sort of in a way, he, this this is something that we we don't know if this latest shift back into a, a Shujen as a brand by Made In as some sort of more conscious sort of uh, and reflexive sort of play on the corporate identity that you know some other artists worldwide have done or not and it, it seems like this is still yeah it's, I mean it's just just for context what he's referring to is that for a period of time all of the work was not made by Shujen it was made by Made In Company and then actually just at the beginning of this year. Shujen, or actually last year, Shujen was rela relaunched as a brand uh, that belonged fully to the company. So it was kind of like the next step in erasing the self to kind of then reconstitute the self as a product of the, the thing that was created to not be the self. Um, and in fact, our show was called just Shujen, a made in company production. And, and you'll see on the tags to many of the works, this kind of uh, dual credit. It's interesting because you chose specifically for the book to focus on uh, the works of Xu Zhen. Um, how did that affect the editorial process, and did that mean an actual selection of of earlier works versus latest wor later works? Or I don't know how do you how did you see that kind of whole problematic related to the book? Well, oh, there are a number of different aspects to this. First of all, um, Xu Zhen really wanted to just have the book concentrate on the pre what, June two thousand and nine works. So as Xu Zhen as Xu Zhen, um, because there is a, a really big cut when it, you know shift when it becomes um, <coughs> made in. Um, the other point is that the thought was well, it's really at that when we started developing the book, it was really too early to to uh, to discuss made in in depth because it was still something very very new, still developing rapidly. Um, and so the idea was, well, we do this book first, and later on, we can always do another book. Of course, in, in the meantime, uh, Phil has just curated this show <laughs> in Beijing, and UCCA's uh, book will be coming out also in the near future, and that will give a much better context to what is, um, what is made in. So, the only works about made in, specific made in works that are included in the book are those that are relevant to uh, the discussion of his, you know, all the work up to, you know, June 2009 and works 
that have been referenced in specific essays, such as the, the, uh, the essay by David Elliott, uh, and also I think one by uh, Philippe Perrot. So that was the main thing. There were mainly really practical considerations. And also, there was really more than enough to discuss just with uh, the pre-2009 work. So that was the main thing. <coughs> Zhenhua, how do you think uh, that having been part of the kind of earlier system around post sense sensibility before the market, how do you think that uh, memory or that presence kind of lingers in the works of artists like Xu Zhen who are, who are now active? I mean, do you still feel uh, that original, you know, those original questions at play or do you still feel some of that energy there? Of course, I, I think that's uh, still playing a very important role for, uh, for several generations um, because first of all, people that didn't believe in uh, one system or people that don't believe in one so-called position of being artists. So that's why they're trying a lot uh, of being um, kind of multiple uh, uh, or having a multiple functionality in the society. So I think that's still there because I still think, you know, Xu Zhen, uh, Xu Zhen is not only Xu Zhen for me. Xu Zhen is a, a networking or something. It's, a, it's kind of a dynamically still kind of generating a lot of creative ideas and a lot of a lot of interesting um, uh, market uh, kind of uh, legends for the moment. So I think, and also that reflected on his um, artistic work. So I think that's bring him into a, a stage of continuously kind of learning. Because um, if we saw the show um, at the unlimited, the moment, the, his work and, and eternity, uh, it's produced in Sangali in Kunskizrai. So I think that's, that's his you know, trying of uh, actually bre breaking through, even with uh, the notion of being an artist and, and restrained by the production in China. So I think that's also how he planned himself, not traveling, but you know, with idea traveling to the uh, outside of China and you know, complete with a kind of concept. So I think that's, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of this I can see um, and I can, understand that this has come out of uh, this um, before post sense sensibility uh, moment, you know, like when a young artist kind of trying and try to learn from other people or try to kind of figure out what's really happening in China and what uh, they want to stand on. So I think that's all this kind of, uh, kind of self uh, initiated uh, kind of position, I think is uh, still there as a very uh, valuable kind of spirit. But of course, I mean, recently I also talked with uh, uh, Lu Jie about, you know, like artists collaborating with more and more different kind of galleries and how he, I mean, how people handling with that. So I think that's also um, an interesting thing that from the artist side or from the gallery side or from the institution side, from the media side, we all have to learn to adapt to this kind of new situation of this shifting of positions. So I think, uh, yeah, Xu Zhen is... Uh, it's the key for that, yeah. I mean, one place we could also really uh, look at him in particular would be in relation to the, let's say, the expanding kind of global consciousness of artists in China, uh, both as an agent of that through creating things like Art Baba, which is a user-generated forum where people can see images of, you know, I'm sure there are thousands of images of Art Basel and all the exhibitions around this uh, town on there now to uh, being seen by art students all over the country who I didn't have the opportunity to travel here. Um, but we see this also in his work. And I, I've, for this one, I keep coming back to a piece that was presented at, at Shanghai uh, in 2011, uh, The Empty White Cube, um, where uh, you, you just had these kind of people ca caught inside throwing sculptures over the top. And, the, and these sculptures were kind of these just extremely um, kind of funny juxtapositions of elements that I, mean, I think a lot of what Xu Zhen is trying to do like, is to satirize some idea that he has of a global language of contemporary art, you know, a sort of syntax of um, a metaphorical syntax of how things might fit together. And it's an interesting because it's a reading that's coming from him. He, of course, he doesn't fly, so he sees maybe less in the flesh than, than others. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe Daniel's an interesting person to comment on this, just like what, um, how do you position him in relation to this kind of, um, this generation of artists, uh, you know, has been called the on-off generation. Um, I, I think you could argue that he's a, a sort of opening figure in that. I mean, we could call it 10 other things. Um, 
what sort of relationship do you see, and what and how do you see the state of uh, of of that consciousness on the part of uh, of younger artists, you know, Sujan and onward uh, today? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a bit of a. I mean, you, there are some elements where he's he, he's he's often often playing on, you know. I mean, like I I don't know. In some ways, I always feel like some elements of Xu Zhen's work is similar to Mike Kelly's work. Or I mean, you know, I you. But I mean, all artists you can sort of point at you know influence and references and and that sort of thing. And there is certainly you know I think maybe to link this back to the uh, you know Chineseness of it. There are certainly aspects of of Xu Zhen's oeuvre that. I really think someone in China could 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 do. I mean, the the Kevin Carter piece is something that I just cannot imagine happening really uh, many uh, other places. But uh, <laughs> to to you, what's your question again? No, I mean, it's not really. It, I, I guess I'm just. I really do see him as a a, a, pop, a, per, a popularizing presence. Let's say both through his work and kind of through these online initiatives. Um, I mean, I guess I think he definitely has his, in some ways, uh, he, this interest. I mean, one element of his work is has his interest in a, a very pop, uh, uh, almost like uh, that pushes. I think in China for for certain tastes, and maybe I'm thinking a little bit more regionally in Shanghai, but a uh, certain taste that is a, a little bit against this, like very pop, very uh, uh, sort of investigation of. Unconscious sort of sort of sort of elements like you know things that are, get into certain grotesque stuff or, or or very mediated sort of stuff and maybe there is some you know some of the influence on from Xu Zhen to something like Double Fly I mean I don't know I mean I sort of see uh, some sort of connection there. I think that's very interesting uh, topic if you talk about Double Fly and also I think one thing I want to add on more uh, to Phil's uh, question. I think uh, it's interesting also we see, uh, for example, with the post-sensibility issues. Uh, once I was chatting with Chiu Zhijie, he said, you know, uh, he tried to ca get, catch a link between the Chinese kind of a new experimental art and with the, that time, at that time, the 90s trend of the English and sensation show. So I think that's also an interesting uh, way of uh, talking about this kind of question, you know, between this kind of if, affecting situation between the Chinese and the, and, uh, and the world. And uh, I think, yeah, that's certainly a, 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 learning, a learning process for uh, young Chinese artists, you know, because they are more ac accessible to this so-called international information um, by reading pictures, by getting no, um, by uh, getting uh, no information, but also from uh, people like Phil, like uh, Chris, like you, you know, came from the overseas and bringing more information to um, to the to the thinking pond uh, or to the to the society in China, especially for the art world. So I think, uh, but uh, I'm always interested in you know what really came out of that because I think uh, it is interesting that people see ah okay I read about Tammy Hearst I want to do the similar thing but actually it's not really there it's not really you know they're just copying it it's it's not not that easy because I think uh, the Chinese young artists, especially like Xu Zhen, Xu Zhen's kind, they're very, very smartly uh, kind of pay attention about uh, at a very early time about um, kind of being aware of the of the of the so-called uh, the conception issues of contemporary art, which is which is I think is been maybe a little bit later, you know, been discussed in in Europe. And I think that's that's something. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, well, there's a whole other conversation I have here about the uh, notion of Shanghai, right? About which is a concept that kind of appears in 2009 online and literally refers to uh, a mountain village where there's kind of a lawless climate, and that was a, a way of talking about counterfeiting and and copying and imitation. But it's it's a kind of it's a, it's a kind of subversive appropriation that also implies a a weird kind of uh, transformation, uh, and I, I think this is. Very key to understanding a lot of uh, a lot of his pieces. I wonder if there's. I mean, just because I don't want to get too specific. Um, you know, Shanghai is a city that it, where he was born, where he's raised, where he continues to work. Um, is do we see anything specific to that city and that urban condition uh, as compared to anyone else uh, in in his work over these twenty years? I mean, you're a you're a native Beijinger. Maybe you. Uh, have some thoughts, but I mean, I, Chris, you lived in Shanghai for a number of years. I don't know. Is is that a is that a relevant uh, interpretive construct? 
I find it really hard to say that he's a specifically Shanghai artist. Uh, looking at other, you know, very much Shanghai artists. Well, I mean, there's somebody who's also from Beijing, but has lived lives in Shanghai as Yang Fudong, or you've got. Um, Zhou Tiehai, there's certainly a sensibility there between the two of them in terms of their, their use of uh, subversive parody and the fact that both use ways of you know, Marshall, turning Marshall McLuhan's idea of you know, the medium is the message and the message becomes just more medium and becomes sort of an infernal combustion machine. So there's th those sorts of ideas, but I don't see them as specifically Shanghai. Um, indeed, I can... It's, it's easy to... Get, to um, to make comparisons with other artists, but I think that post-internet, there is a, a small group of artists around the world who use humor, who use parody and satire uh, as you know, very, very intricately tied to the, the central elements of what their work is. And it, some of these just happen to be Chinese. Uh, so along with Xu Zhen, there is also Sun Yuan and Peng Yu. Uh, but looking more uh, to other countries, you know, I think there's a lot in common between Xu Zhen and uh, Ryan Gander uh, in, in their way, ways of analyzing and producing and doing in, in multivalent and diverse ways. Or uh, you could look at somebody like Irvin Worm. So um, I think that is very, very interesting. There's, uh, one of the things that I was very much wanted to be against is, is that um, is treating art from China as being somehow ghettoized, it, it's still in the world, on the world plane, Western art gets privileged. It, and there's lots of you know, obvious reasons for that happening. But at the end of the day, great art, compelling, interesting artists, no matter where they come from, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be categorizing them geographically. So in terms of producing this book, we wanted it to be informed by the history and the culture from which, uh, which produced Xu Zhen and produced Made In. But it was always very, very important to, f first of all, concentrate on the art, then concentrate on the artist, and then, and then to put it within the widest sort of intellectual and historical context we could as well. Just so, because once you've got it from those, that sort of base, you can go out in lots of different directions. So as a Shanghai uh, artist, yes, I mean, that con contributes to who he is. It's uh, this major metropolis. Um, but he is so many other things as well. It can be dangerous talking about just, uh, just that. John Hua, any further thoughts um, uh, about his work? About, uh, actually, I, I, yeah. <laughs> actually I'm, I have a question for you. <laughs> because I went to see the Xu Chen show you did in UCCA. I'm, I'm really interested, like, um, like for example, with the with the uh, um, Shang Art shop, you know why you put it in the front, and also why you mixed all these kind of uh, made in uh, ideas and his other kind of work together, and in what kind of notion, you know why? Because you're you're involved with uh, uh, producing the show and also you know the concept and, and so on and so on. Because as I know you since 2005, we know each other, and I think you know you you have a a lot of ideas and been working with many, many Chinese artists. And why you select Xu Zhen, first of all, and why you show Xu Zhen in this kind of context. And, you know, yeah. No, I mean, the, the amazing thing about the show uh, that we did was, was the total polyphony of, uh, of works, of ideas, of images, um, only governed by one very straightforward and absolute principle, which was that there was this axis down the center and everything was duplicated on both sides. So it was completely symmetrical um, feeling in that way, like the Forbidden City or like St. Peter's Cathedral or whatever, you know, sort of he's finding these kind of logics that kind of run across all cultures and civilizations. And that was uh, somehow the, the sort of framework on which we could hang everything. Um, I mean, there were some great juxtapositions in that show. Like when you first walked in, you saw the video rainbow that was mentioned before next to this, uh, very brightly colored rainbow guanyin that was made in in, in San Kalen. Um, I think showing in like about two seconds the progression that had happened in these 20 years from you know making art in in the apartment to uh, you know working just technically uh, on a much higher level let's say. Um, but it was also about following a kind of 
path kind of through a uh, succession of spaces. And, and it was about like um, a condition where you're completely bombarded and overloaded with, with signals and information. And how, how do you try to make sense of that, uh, make sense of the world in that context, which I think is what so much of, of what he's doing is also about. I mean, in terms of why him, why then, uh, it, it was just extremely exciting to give the stage over to you know an artist born in 1977 to do um, something at, at that scale. And um, I, it was interesting to, to see the reaction just because, I mean, I think even you know artists younger, artists older, uh, people from abroad, people from China with no experience of contemporary art, I mean, all um, found something to identify with in that show just because there was simply so much there to choose from in a way. Uh, so it was a kind of structure without, uh, without being a structure, I guess. It certainly wasn't a chronological uh, room by room overview of a practice, but of course he's you know completely ill suited to that kind of a treatment. I think so. Anyway, we're um, we're getting towards the end of our time, so I guess it's a good moment to open things up. Um, I think the bell sort of signaling the fair about the end is going to ring any minute now. So if there's anyone who wants to ask anything of these guys, uh, please go ahead. You can always just buy the book. And if there's not, yeah, that's <laughs> fine too. Um. <laughs> no, I think everyone just wants to go and yeah, have a drink. I th yeah, I mean, it's, it is 6.45 <laughs> on the Friday of the fair. So I think with that, um, congratulations. This is very exciting to finally see uh, a monograph here before us. There are copies uh, at the front of the room. Uh, the book is Shu Jen. It's published by Distans. It's edited by Chris Moore. And there are contributions from Philippe Parade and David Elliott. And there's, that's the end of the panel, okay? <laughs> Thanks for coming, okay. Thank you. Thank you.